Welcome back to another episode of the award-winning Legal Toolkit podcast, only on the Legal Talk Network. Twice a month, we're delivering law practice management tips and tricks into your ear holes. My name is Jared Korea, and because John Tesh was unavailable, I'm your host. I'm the CEO of Red Cave Law Firm Consulting, a business management consulting service for attorneys. Find us online at www.redcave.legal. I'm the COO of Guinean Software, Inc. as well. We build chatbots so law firms can convert more leads. You can find out more about Gideon at www.gideon.legal. Before we get rolling, I'd like to take a moment to thank my mom for listening to every episode. Hi, mom. I'd also like to thank our sponsors. They're the reason you're listening to the show right now. We would like to thank Alert Communications for sponsoring this podcast. If any law firm is looking for call, intake, or retainer services available 24-7, 365, just call 866-827-5568. Scorpion is the leading provider of marketing solutions for the legal industry. With nearly 20 years of experience serving attorneys, Scorpion can help grow your practice. Learn more at scorpionlegal.com. Abby Connect has delivered premium live receptionist and answering services to lawyers since 2006. You can try them out for free at abbyconnect.com. TimeSolve is the number one web-based time and billing software for lawyers. Providing solutions since 1999, TimeSolve provides the most comprehensive billing features for law firms big and small. www.timesolve.com If you're a boring old baseball fan like I am, yes, I'm old, just had a birthday. But if you do love baseball like I do, numbers are a big deal. Ted Williams. Boston Red Sox, was the last guy to hit 400. And he got all the way up to 406. In fact, on the last day of the season, the regular season, in 1941, he was playing in a doubleheader. And he could have sat out and saved his average. He was at like 401. But instead, he played the doubleheader, went six for eight, and raised his average. As always, Ted Williams was a badass. Hank Aaron, all-time home run leader for a career, in the steroid-free bracket was 715. Roger Maris broke Babe Ruth's long-standing single-season home run record in 1961 when he hit, appropriately enough, 61 home runs. But he got slapped with an asterisk because Ruth did it in 154 games and Maris did it in 162. The modern record for lowest single-season ERA is Bob Gibson's iconic 1.12 in 1968 though a dude with three fingers got as low as 1.06 in 1906. That's right, three fingers, but I digress. So baseball may seem like an American sport from a bygone era. You know, like when crowds could actually attend games, remember that? But baseball has been at the forefront of the statistical revolution in sports since, I don't know, since there was one. So in baseball, sabermetrics is what they call the study of data analytics. And it was named that way by Bill James, who was one of the founders of that approach. And a really weird dude, if you look up his Wikipedia. But Bill James wasn't the only guy who was an innovator in data analytics and sports. Davy Johnson, who would later become the manager of the Mets. I hated Davy Johnson because the uh, Mets beat the Red Sox in the World Series in 1986 when he was managing. Let's not bring that up. Before he became a manager and a front office executive, he actually wrote a Fortarian program while he was still playing to convince his manager, who was Earl Weaver, that he should bat second in the Orioles lineup. Earl Weaver was not convinced, and as Earl Weaver was wont to do, he probably just swore a lot about it. Most famously, however, we've got Billy Bean of the Oakland A's, who focused on marketing inefficiencies, or I should say market inefficiencies, in order to target players who put up stats in categories that were helpful, but undervalued. This approach was made famous by the book and movie, which you may have seen or read Moneyball, in that you see Billy Bean pining after Kevin Euclid, who played for the Red Sox. He nicknamed him the Greek god of walks. On base percentage, which means you get on base as a player, by any means, was a highly sought-after metric in the ace talent acquisition model. So, Perhaps unsurprisingly, because teams have had success with this for years, the trend for data analytics improvement continues in baseball, and teams keep finding new market inefficiencies. 
This year, the Tampa Bay Rays made the World Series with one of the bottom most payrolls in baseball by targeting certain player traits. And it's not just baseball. Other sports executives use data to change the game, too, even if it's not always an improvement. The NBA, for example, has become a league where teams just jack up three-pointers all game long because it took teams almost 40 years to figure out that three points is more than two points, and the more threes you shoot, there's an advantage, a mathematical advantage for taking long-range shots. Did you know that there's even an annual sports data analytics conference that's held at MIT in Boston every year? It's called the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. Of course, sports aren't the only industry that lean on data analytics. Plenty of industries do. And even Billy Bean is moving on to an investment role. But guess what industry doesn't use data analytics? Well, you probably already know. The legal industry. Shocker, right? Legal is such a competitive field and has been for some time that solo and small firms should absolutely be using data to gain a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Yet they don't. You don't see innovation in this space for whatever reason. There aren't any legal data analytics conferences. And I wonder when attorneys will start to focus on data and data analytics so that they can start making more data-based decisions about their businesses. Could it be in the 2040s when the sun burns out and everyone is living on Jupiter? Somewhere in between there, right? I think the reason for the reluctance of attorneys to actually use data in their practices, in addition to the fact that law firms are generally behind the curve on just about everything, is that concept of data seems overwhelming, right? Because I think what most people think of business data, they're thinking of big data, quote unquote, like what Google and Facebook have to deal with. But in case you didn't already know, your law firm is decidedly not Google or Facebook or MySpace or even Netscape Navigator. Okay, I'll stop. While law firms could access big data, which really means generalized anonymized data about law firm clients and processes, that data is not effectively organized across the industry, and so it's not widely available. However, that doesn't stop your law firm from using small data. I mean, think about it. You've got a corpus of information in your law firm through which you can measure your clients and your staff and the activity of those two groups. Even if you started with basic financial data, like which law firms are motivated to track effectively, right? Because if you want to get paid, you want to track your financial information. If they use that to make determinants about value and efficiency, that's a big win. So through the simplest action of applying KPIs and generating reports, you'd have a better sense of your profitability and your effectiveness. So start there and increase your competitive advantage marginally as you move forward. This is about winning on the margins, and you can worry about big data later, like when I have eight webbed fingers on my left hand. Now, let's take a moment to listen to a word from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. Now more than ever, an effective marketing strategy is one of the most important things your law firm can have, and Scorpion can help. With nearly 20 years of experience serving the legal industry, Scorpion has proven methods to help you get the high-value cases you deserve. Join thousands of attorneys across the country who have turned to Scorpion for effective marketing and technology solutions. For a better way to grow your practice, visit scorpionlegal.com. Your legal work requires your full attention. So how can you build lasting relationships with new or existing clients while juggling your caseload? Try Abby Connect, the friendly, highly trained, and motivated live receptionists who are well-known for providing consistent quality customer service and support to law firms just like yours. Every connection matters. So call Abby Connect today at 833-ABBY-WOW to get started with your free 14-day trial and $95 off your first bill. Okay, it's about time to get to the crunchy sun butter in the middle of the sandwich. Fun fact, I actually hate sun butter, but I'm allergic to peanut butter. But not allergic to peanut butter in a way that is helpful. I became allergic to peanut butter at 25, so I know how great it tastes, and I have to eat sun butter. All right, that's my digression. Let's interview our guest. My guest today is Jay Harrington, who's the principal of Harrington Communications. Jay, thank you for joining us. How are you today? Jared, it's good to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. And I, I kind of want to hear more about the peanut butter, sun butter. It's awful, man. Like, have you ever had sun butter? 
I've never had it. Never heard of it, actually. Sunflower butter. So I'm allergic to nuts. I can't have nuts. I can only have seeds. And people are like, oh, it's similar. But it's not. It has like a horrible aftertaste. And if you've been allergic to nuts your whole life, it doesn't matter. But I used to be able to eat peanut butter sandwiches, and I can't anymore. And it's devastating. So Yeah, I feel for you. I live a sad life. Um, <laughs> in any event, <laughs> thank you for coming back. This is like time number three on the show for you. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm in, uh, is that the Hall of Fame uh, number you have to reach to get in? You are like the Steve Martin of Saturday Night Live for the Legal Toolkit, which I don't know <laughs> what that gets you, but that's what you are. <laughs> yeah, that's good enough to be here right there. That's a, <laughs> a hearty we congratulations get, We can end the show you. right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're done. Yeah, you guys were lucky enough to watch me download software before we recorded this podcast. <laughs> good times. <laughs> uh, but before we lose everyone's attention, can you tell people what you do? Sure. So a few different things. So I, I am a lawyer. I no longer practice, but about a decade ago or a little more, I started with my wife, a marketing agency, and we serve primarily law firms, other firms and professional services as well. But we handle various aspects of marketing, website design, branding, we do PR, uh, and we specialize in what we call thought leadership marketing. So helping law firms and lawyers turn their expertise into new business. And in addition to that, I, I do individual business coaching. I do training for groups of lawyers. And uh, I also write quite a bit. I've written a few books and do a lot of writing in various platforms. Yeah, you're a beast. You write a lot. And do I, is, is it Harrington Communications? Do I have the name right? It is, yeah. We just okay. it, over the over the last decade, it's just sort of become Harrington, um, you know, as shorthand. But it is Harrington Communications. Okay, good. I want to be formal and correct about this. Thank you. So I want to talk to you about all that stuff because, yeah, you're everywhere. You write a lot. It's impressive. Um, I think I write a lot. I bet you write more than me. So this notion of like thought leadership, right? And you've got something going called the Thought Leadership Project too, right? You hear that thrown around a lot. It's kind of like business terminology that people use. And it's like, what, what is thought leadership? Does it mean like you have more profound thoughts than everyone else? You like Rene Descartes? Do you have a bigger brain? What does that have to do with business thought leadership? Yeah, well, I think it's basically, especially if we contextualize this for the legal industry, what we're talking about, yeah. you know, general counsel, buyers of legal services, they've told lawyers over and over, but what they really want and what they really have are not necessarily legal problems, but business problems. Yeah. And so, you know, through your content creation, and that's what we're talking about when we're talking about creating thought leadership, you can essentially kind of look out into the future and, and chart a course for others to follow. So the idea being through the content you create, you're helping your clients and prospective clients really see what they need to be thinking about in the future, the risks, the opportunities, the things that they need to be thinking about to take their business to the next level. And, you know, I think most lawyers are capable of taking what they know and translating that into thought leadership. The mm -hmm. key is, how do you actually do that? What platforms do you use? Can you do so in a way that connects and resonates with an audience? Are you consistent enough to you know, be visible to the people you're trying to reach? And you know, essentially, does your, can you take your ideas and transform them into thoughts and content that resonates with your audience such that when they face an opportunity related to an issue that you as the thought leader address, then they naturally think of you as a potential you know, firm or individual who can help them to address that problem or opportunity. Yeah, I like this notion of like, you're the captain of a ship, right? And you're a sailor. Mm -hmm. We're gonna hold that, hold that thought, everybody who's listening. We're gonna talk a little bit more about sailing in the next segment. That's a tease for you. Um, <laughs> so I think that, I think one of the things that I find that's interesting about lawyers is like, you talk to them about doing this kind of thought leadership stuff online. And they're like, oh man, that's so different from what I normally do. But functionally, it's very similar to what lawyers are doing at cocktail parties when we used to be able to have those like 10 years ago and events where you were talking to people and like kind of discussing like, here's what I do. I'm good at this. These are the kind of cases I work on. It's not that different from what lawyers do already. It's just a different media, right? Yeah, I agree with that. And I think that that, that mindset that you identified, I mean, part of it's, I, I, I definitely run into lawyers who resist the idea of creating content like this because oh, yeah. 
they're afraid of you know giving away the the secret sauce, so to speak. Um, so they <laughs> hold back, right? The, their content, if they do create it, it's not particularly effective because they're sort of holding back from sharing their best ideas. And right. the way I try to talk to them about it is, well, if you were you know, if you're sitting down to lunch with a prospective client and they were talking to you about the challenges they're facing you likely wouldn't hold back, you know, the answer and say, oh, well, I'll tell you what <laughs> needs to happen once you hire me. That's just not the right, way it works, right? right? <laughs> they wouldn't have confidence. And in, in, I mean, unless you're the most renowned expert in your space, you know, that they might yeah. have the leverage to do that. But the same principle applies. All you're doing in the case of creating thought leadership content is having a asynchronous communication with the world, really. I mean, you're you're sharing your ideas into a broader marketplace, which allows you to meet more people and have those conversations that can lead to a business development conversation later. Right, right. And that's a good way to think about it, too, I think, is like having lunch with somebody. Like, you're not going to get up from the table and be like, here's a contract. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's exactly. It's not some negotiation or, or whatever. It's a free exchange of ideas. At least it should be if you're hoping right. to develop new right. business. And, and that's the way you need to think about it, you know, from a content creation perspective as well. And how do you get lawyers to get over the hump of like doing that content themselves? Like, I agree. Some of it is like, we don't want to give away the secret sauce. But the other of it is like, I talk to lawyers and they're like, eh, I don't want to write. Can I farm that out to somebody? But it's so much more authentic and it resonates so much better if like you, the attorney, do it. So attorneys are super busy. How do you get them to build the content in the first place? Well, uh, you know, it, in the I guess it's it's a mindset shift that, it, well, here's the first thing. I mean, one would be, it's increasingly important to do this sort of marketing because, as you mentioned, Jared, like you can't do cocktails parties anymore. Yeah. This is the way that people are communicating their ideas into the world. And if you're not visible, if you're not creating that digital footprint, then you're going to be sort of toiling in obscurity. You know, it's the way in which we are communicating in this environment, and it will increasingly be so in the future. I mean, even before the pandemic, there's research by um, Gartner which found that when it comes to buyers of sophisticated professional services, like legal services, buyers are making it almost 60% of the way through the buying process before they're ever reaching out to an individual service provider, which yeah. means that they're, they're doing their due diligence, they're vetting and winnowing down their options online. And you know, one of the few signals among all of the noise online is real, viable and impressive thought leadership. And and so that's the kind of thing that is allowing people to find, you know, lawyers and other service providers is is the thought leadership. So so the mindset shift is, you know, this needs to be my most important priority. If I'm looking to mm. build a practice, well then, you know, it doesn't have to be creating thought leadership content, but I would argue that it's increasingly important to do so. And so if you're if you're looking to build a practice, you need to devote at least some time to these things every day. One of the ways, I guess I'll give a practical tip that I've, yeah, yeah. that's Go helped some lawyers get over the hump is, because they do oftentimes have a hard time digging into like a 1500 word article that they've got to write. <laughs> right. so, um, so instead make it easy on yourself, like start writing on LinkedIn, for example, start writing posts a few times a week on LinkedIn where you know it's 1300 characters, 200 words, that is much more manageable where you're sharing ideas, right. you know, through posts on LinkedIn. And then the beauty of that is, A, you are you have a baked in audience to consume that content and you're getting instantaneous feedback as to what ideas might be worth expanding upon on a, in a thought leadership article. So, you know, you write three posts a week, you're writing them related to topics that pertain to your, your practice and your expertise. Yeah. And then two of them might just go over like lead balloons, but one might really get a lot of feedback and engagement from your audience. And then you might take that idea and expand upon it in a longer form article. So do some, you know, do some beta testing, essentially. Don't yep, dive right in without any sense of whether an idea is resonant. Do some testing on LinkedIn first. Yeah, let me talk about that a little bit. What I've noticed, which is interesting, because I watch you, Jay Harrington, from the bushes outside your house. No, just kidding, <laughs> from LinkedIn. I've noticed that you've been posting a lot of more long-form content on LinkedIn. And the reason it's interesting to me is I've started to do the same thing because I found that that gets more views than shorter-form content. So it seems like this is a nice mechanism to use if you're an attorney who's not willing or necessarily able at this point to write the longer form content, just to write longer form content on social media services as those character limits allow. Have you done that intentionally? And when did you start to see that as a viable mechanism for content marketing? 
Yeah, um, I've I've always posted on LinkedIn, but I you know I used to have the mindset that social media was a place to primarily share content that I've written elsewhere, right? I write a blog post on my website. I then include a link to that post on LinkedIn and I share that. A couple months ago, maybe three months ago, I've, I started, as you mentioned, Jared, posting a lot more directly on LinkedIn. So, Mm -hmm. you know, there's the the post field you write in that, that's where you have 1300 characters, which translates into about 200 words. So it's not really long form, but it's certainly longer than like a tweet on Twitter. Long form for social media. Yeah, (laughs) it is. It is. So, so yeah. And that has really been impactful. And, you know, just as from a results standpoint, I definitely have gotten way more engagement ton more inbound connections and actually, you know, a fair amount of new business just from that, just from doing that. Because again, it goes back to this idea that if you're writing all of your thought leadership content on your website and your website alone, well, you know, you might be visible in Google search. There might be a certain number of people who have signed up for your email newsletter. Uh, There might be people that just simply visit your site periodically and will read your content. But, you know, that's a probably a pretty small audience relative to what you can cultivate on LinkedIn, you know, where you're, Mm -hmm. you're creating content and sharing it, you might have thousands of followers and connections on LinkedIn. And by doing this practice of creating more content and being more visible on the platform, you'll continue to grow your audience much more in in a more exponential manner as well. There's two primary things that I see as major benefits. One is, you have the ability to to kind of cultivate responses that indicate whether you're on to a good idea with your with your shorter form content to be able to spin that into longer form content written right. elsewhere. Yeah. And then also just the practice of writing, say, a daily post on LinkedIn, it might take 20 or 30 minutes. That's not nothing, but it's not as much time as it takes to write a longer article. Yeah. Um, but the constraints that LinkedIn imposes where you have to get a a good idea across in 200 words. It's really good writing practice as well. So, and thinking practice, frankly. So it really, it really keeps me thinking about the issues that matter to my audience. And I think lawyers can do that as well. Yeah. So speaking of real long form content, right? You've written more books than Dr. Seuss, I think. (laughs) Um, It's amazing to me. What is your latest so I, I published a book in July called The Productivity Pivot, and it is a book for lawyers. I've written all my books for lawyers, and this one uh, is a little different. It's, it's really for lawyers at any level of experience, but the book is focused on an issue that I kept bumping up against in my coaching practice, where, you know, in coaching, you start, you work with a client, you start by kind of casting a vision, helping them set goals, and yep. then creating a plan for moving forward, you know, and, and most of my coaching is centered around business development. And, you know, that's where you run into this roadblock sometimes with clients, which is, okay, you've got your plan in place. Now it's time to go. It's time to start taking action. <laughs> and, then, right. and then you get the response, well, I don't possibly have the time to do all that. <laughs> um, so, so this book was really meant to help address that issue, which is, you know, you need to make business development a priority. And it doesn't need to take all of your time, but it needs to take at least some of your time. And I suggest it takes some time every day. Yeah. So the books, the, the kind of the core principle of the book is taken from, a, from an anecdote from Charlie Munger, you know, Warren Buffett's business partner, Berkshire mm-hmm. Hathaway, who's also a lawyer. And when he was a young lawyer, he, he kind of came upon the realization that he was spending all of his time billing hours for clients, right? And he realized that if he was ever really going to get ahead in the way he wanted to, he needed to start prioritizing himself as his own most important client, as he put it, and starting to sell himself one hour of his time each day to work Mm -hmm. on things like business development, other projects that were more for him, as opposed to giving away all his best time for his clients. That's certainly important, but the way he did it was, you know, I can spend at least 10% of my time working for myself. Right. So I'm working sort of on my practice, on my goals and objectives, and not just my clients. And so that's a core principle that I address in the book, which is that it's not easy. But if you buy into the idea that over the long term of your career, building a practice is the thing that's going to bring you more autonomy, more you know financial rewards, more success, and, mm-hmm. and more, more happiness in the sense that you're always going to be beholden to clients to a certain extent, but it's you know, it compounds things when you're beholden to clients and your colleagues at your firm who have business. So building that practice for yourself is what's going to allow you to have a longer, satisfying career than if you don't put that work in. All right, everybody. 
pick up the productivity pivot. It's a good holiday stocking stuffer, I would say. Jay, this was tremendous. Thanks for coming on today. I appreciate you taking the time. Jared, much appreciated as always. And I, I look forward to number four. Number four. Yeah, two years from now, we'll, we'll hit that up. So you got the Thought Leadership Project. You got Harrington Communications. You got the books. If somebody wants to reach out to you, how can they do that? I'd say visit our website, which is hcommunications.biz. You'll find everything there. And then connect with me on LinkedIn. As we've talked about, I'm active on LinkedIn. I love to engage with people on that platform. So you can find me there and I'd love to connect. All right. Thanks again. That's Jay Harrington from Harrington Communications. We'll take one final sponsor break so you can hear more about what our sponsors can do for your law practice. Then stay tuned for the rump roast. It's even more supple than the roast beast. As the largest legal-only call center in the U.S., Alert Communications helps law firms and legal marketing agencies with new client intake. Alert captures and responds to all leads 24-7, 365 as an extension of your firm in both Spanish and English. Alert uses proven intake methods, customizing responses as needed, which earns the trust of clients and improves client retention. To find out how Alert can help your law office, call 866-827-5568 or visit alertcommunications.com slash LTN. Imagine billing day being the happiest day of the month instead of the day you dread. Nobody went to law school because they love drafting invoices for clients. At TimeSolve, our attorneys save on average over eight hours a month in billing work. That means more billable time and turning billing day into happy day. Learn more about how to get to your time and billing happy place at timesolve.com. That's www.timesolv, leave off the e, dot com. Remember, that's T-I-M-E-S-O-L-V dot com. All right, everybody, welcome back. We're here again at the rear end of the legal toolkit, the rump roast. It's a grab bag of short form topics of my choosing. And today we're going to bring in a new guest, Tom Nixon. Tom, welcome. How are you? I'm great, Jared. Thanks for having me on, even though I am at the rump end here. <laughs> <laughs> a little nervous or no? Nothing well, to be nervous about. <laughs> it's, it feels like familiar territory, to be honest. <laughs> um, and you work with Jay, right? I do. I'm his business partner. I've known Jay for, I don't know, 15 years or so now. Cool. And uh, what do you do over at Harrington Communications? Uh, similar to what you discussed in the last segment with Jay, I share clients and, and we're working with them on thought leadership initiatives. Um, most of my clients are outside of the legal realm at this point, but I do have some law firm and attorney clients as well. Gotcha. And so when does it become Harrington Nixon Communications? Come on. Let's well, make that happen. I think it's going to be Nixon Harrington, but... <laughs> <laughs> well played. Yes. Always ask for more. <laughs> We're even Nixon and Associates might sound right, good. <laughs> right, right. The Nixon group. All right. All right. We'll work on that. So we just talked about content marketing, thought leadership, stuff that you guys talk about on your thought leadership podcast. But I want to take a little time to talk about a prurient interest of your own, which is Yacht Rock. Is it uh, fair yes. to say that you love Yacht Rock? No, I adore no. Yacht Rock and <laughs> um, I have an unhealthy obsession, <laughs> honestly. You even have a Yacht Rock podcast, right? I do, yeah. We, I went out looking for a podcast to discuss Yacht Rock and couldn't find one that was active, so I created one with my brother. Oh, no. oh you're, you had that show with your brother. That's cool. Now, what's your brother's interest in Yacht Rock? Well, he's a professional musician by trade. He's an audio engineer to earn a living, and he grew up in the era, so he's a little older than I am, and he has a Yacht Rock project of his own called Page 99. Oh, really? Yeah. So is that a band that he's Yep, in? it sure is, yep. And what's the name of the podcast? Uh, the Yacht Rock Podcast. Uh, <laughs> subtitled. Not a lot of competition out there, right? <laughs> we want it to be discovered, so we did get uh, YachtRockPodcast.com, and we are parenthetically titled Out of the Main, because our mission is to find new Yacht Rock or kind of buried oh, treasures nice. Yeah, nice. that are out of the mainstream. All right, so since you're on the rump roast, which is actually maybe the best part of the show, right? We're going to do something a little bit different. You may agree with this, you may not. I find that rock, Yacht Rock is a controversial subject in some cases because there's no clear definition of what it is, right? And I found that people have strong opinions on this. Do you agree? Oh, my gosh, yes. <laughs> I mean, if you go, you know, there's a whole Yacht Rock community out there, probably most prevalently in Facebook, but they spend their days battling wars <laughs> over is this song <laughs> Yacht Rock or not? 
And the founder nice. of the uh, the concept of Yacht Rock came up with this uh, concept of Nyat, which is a song that is clearly not Yacht. And so, again, you can see these battles <laughs> which waged daily. So, yeah, to say that they're opinionated is an understatement. See, I knew you would be great for this segment. All right, who's the founder of Yacht Rock? I have no idea who that is. So I sometimes refer to him as the prophet. This is a, a guy by the name of J.D. Riznar. <laughs> L. Ron Hubbard? No, go ahead. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, J.D. Riznar is a guy who, in uh, I think around 2005, created this web series um, that you can find at YachtRock.com. And it was sort of a spoof of what he thought yuppies in their 80s would listen to on their yachts. And <laughs> sort of stumbled upon this retroactively applied genre called Yacht Rock, which are artists that in the day probably would have been played on like the light rock formats in yeah. the late 70s. And I and think you 80s. make a good point that there was not like a yacht rock genre in the 80s. <laughs> like this is ab- <laughs> people were not intentionally creating yacht rock. No, exactly. And even some of the artists that are still around today, going back to your controversial thing, is that uh, there are artists today that would eschew the term. They feel oh, like totally. because it yeah. started as a somewhat as a joke that yes. they are the butt of the joke when really, I mean, like <laughs> or my the brother rump and of I. the joke, one might yes, say. Go ahead. Right. And see, in, I'm sure there's some of that, but I would say the thousands of adoring fans like myself and my brother who started our podcast really have a true appreciation for the musicianship, the production quality, and the artistry that went into the late 70s and early 80s, what is otherwise known as the West Coast Cool Sound. So this is what was happening in L.A. at the time. And no, it wasn't called Yacht Rock, but you know there are some... Markers of what ha- of Yacht Rock is, it truly is excellent music. So it's not a joke to us. Yeah. And it's, like I said, it's probably an unhealthy obsession. <laughs> All right. We like to play some games here with our okay. guests. So I want to go through some artists, and I want you to tell me whether or not you think they're Yacht Rockers or not. Okay. And if they are, we'll give them the Michael McDonald stamp of approval. Ooh, excellent. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start slow. Hall and Oates. Yacht Rock? Yacht Rock Hall of Fame? Um, probably technically not, though I do in- Ooh, include right. a small slice of their catalog. Yes. What would be a Hall & Oates song that is like a Yacht Rock song? Uh, Sarah Smiles. Okay. Next, Loggins and Messina. Probably only, uh, it's like guilt by association because Kenny Loggins' portion of his career is considered like the holy text of Yacht Rock. So uh, we include <laughs> oh, totally. some of the earlier stuff with Messina as part of the Yacht Messina's Rock. Messina's more of a country rock guy, having been in Buffalo Springfield. So what right. part What part of the Kenny Loggins catalog is like the Torah of Yacht Rock? <laughs> so probably, uh, you know, the songs This Is It in Heart to Heart. Those yep. are two, you know, they kind of have that. And this is when he was collaborating, by the way, with Michael McDonald. Right. So the influence, he Michael McDonald took Kenny kind of out of that folk sound and into the right. more blue-eyed soul sound that he eventually took the Doobie Brothers into as well. All right. Jerry Rafferty. <laughs> that is controversial. Go into the groups to fa- <laughs> because Baker Street Baker is, Street, very Yacht Rock. <laughs> yeah, but the purists would say no. So yeah. as I got indoctrinated into Yacht Rock, I followed the um, you know the Sirius XM channel, and that that song's in the heavy rotation. But oh yeah, purists will say it, you know you're supposed to have a certain personnel lineup. It's supposed to have a certain kind of rhythmic to it or cadence, and that song doesn't have those things. But eh, I'm not a purist. I'm just a unhealthily obsessed fan. <laughs> right, because you look at the rest of Jerry Rafferty's catalog, and the sound is much different. That yeah. song is like an outlier. It is. You're correct. All right, this one I think is maybe controversial as well, but you can tell me being the expert. Jimmy Buffett. Definitely not. Mm. He is in an adjacent genre that the founder of Yacht Rock invented. I think he coined it, but uh, Marina Rock, which is a delicious (laughs) play on words if you're familiar with the concept of arena rock. Arena Rock, very nice. So Marina Rock is more like boat music, which is what Jimmy Buffett is. It's kind of party, be outside. Yacht Rock isn't necessarily that. You know, I mentioned Doobie Brothers and Michael McDonald. None of that has a nautical theme. It, right. it just happens right. to be, again, what Jada Riznar envisioned a yuppie would be listening to on his yacht in the, around 1980 or so. Although I guess songs like Southern Cross from Crosby, Stills, and Nash, that's like very yacht rock sounding, but nautical yeah. themes there as well. Summer Breeze is another one by... Right, uh, yeah. right. Seals and Crofts. Seals and Crofts. So, yeah. There's some of that that does creep in, but people, for whatever reason, tend to draw the line at Jimmy Buffett, and they draw a hard line. Well, this is good. See, I set you up perfectly. Last one. NWA. <laughs> um, is that hard no? <laughs> that, yeah, that's probably a hard no. Um, 
<laughs> yes, especially the later years. <laughs> Easy E might have something to say about that. Tom, right. yes. you are great. Thank you for coming on. This, this discussion exceeded my wildest expectations. So yeah, they you. must have been low, but I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Can you tell folks how to find your Yacht Rock podcast again? Sure. Yeah. The best place to go is just go yachtrockpodcast.com. But we're pretty active on Facebook. You can find the podcast anywhere that you, you know, you listen to podcasts, Apple, Google, Stitcher, Overcast, et cetera. So give us nice. a listen. Check it out. Uh, check out Tom's work at Harrington Communications as well. And that'll do it for another episode of the Legal Toolkit Podcast, where the volume knob on the stereo of the HMY Britannia is always turned up to 11. Life isn't easy, waiting for more.